Good morning. I have the privilege of getting to call us to order this morning. And I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm Ann Curzan. I'm a professor of English, linguistics, and education here. And I'm also associate dean for humanities. I get about five minutes, which is what all the lightning talks have, and I will try to keep it to that, uh, to welcome you all here. And I want to start by doing a couple of things, one of which is thanking Kristen for for a few things, one of which is her leadership in this second chapter of the Humanities Collaboratory and really helping us think about what this can be in the second chapter. And part of that is hosting, coming up with the idea of this conference and hosting this conference. So thank you for this and really looking forward to being here today. And I also want to recognize and thank Peggy McCracken, who led us through the first chapter of the Humanities Collaboratory, really to think about what this could be. And that was a lot of work, and she stepped up to do that, so I'm very grateful. And I want to recognize Sherry, who is, uh, who's been with the Collaboratory since the beginning and really has been uh, the backbone of this place. And, and I want to recognize that she's doing this she already is the chief administrator for three other units <laughs> and then takes this on um, and has been a wonderful part of the collaboratory. It's also been really fun over the last couple of weeks to work with some of the teams and talk particularly with the undergraduate students who are part of these teams and hear from them about the ways in which the work on these projects has had an impact on their education and their undergraduate careers to get to learn about different kinds of research, to get to be involved in these projects, develop those relationships with their team, with the faculty members, um, really help them, I think for some of them, see, and for some of you all who are here, uh, enhanced your humanities education. And I know for at least a few of you, it has also helped you make the case to your parents about what you can get out of a humanities education. And that is a wonderful thing. I was thinking back, I didn't get to have an opportunity like this when I was an undergraduate uh, to do intensive research with a team of other students and faculty. I did, though, get to do it as a graduate student. And I went to graduate school here at Michigan. So it happened actually in this building where uh, I was working with a faculty member named Frances McSparren, who has since retired as she worked to take the Middle English Dictionary, which was created here, and turn it into the Middle English Compendium, which was an online resource, to take that and put it online. And she got a grant, and it was a grant that could support some students, and so I got the opportunity to get in on the ground floor and help think about what it meant to take that resource and put it online, and it was transformational in my graduate career to get to get that kind of firsthand experience with a faculty member to see what that sort of project looked like. Uh, and I say that to, to emphasize the importance of the collaborative team-based work that the collaboratory is letting us do. So I'm so glad that we get to think here about what this project means and how we wanna go forward. Uh, and I know other people will be speaking about different aspects of the work. I think that one of the things that is really important for this is thinking about, as Earl Lewis was talking about last night, the role of collaboration in humanities research. And the humanities have for a long time been seen as sort of a place where one works by oneself. <laughs> Um, and it has often been one of the things I say when undergraduates are thinking about graduate school and I say, okay, are you really sure that you can sit by yourself with a stack of books or articles and that is going to be fulfilling for you, <laughs> that you will finish that day and feel inspired because that's part of what the work will be. And it certainly is part of what the work will be, but what the collaboratory shows us is what it means to be doing team-based research in the humanities. And one of the things that it has helped me do as associate dean is think about what changes would we want to see in the division to encourage that. And it has helped me make the case, and we implemented this last year, to increase the startups for humanities faculty. So this is the research money that assistant professors get when they come to the university, and to increase that to the point where they could realistically hire students to work with them. And as we've talked with them about that funding, we have said we need to move to a more team-based model where you are thinking about your research in a more team-based way as opposed to just what do I need to do to get my book done. Um, and so that has been exciting. I wanted to also think, put on the table, because I know it's one of the things we're trying to do, a couple of challenges 
for us to be thinking about. I think one is an institutional challenge and one is a challenge to all of us who are doing the research in the humanities. And the institutional challenge, which Earl Lewis talked about last night, and I just want to underline here, is how do we as an institution, and that's at the level of the departments as well as the level of the college and the university, value collaborative work. And this is, there isn't an easy answer to this, but there certainly is a model for this. If you look at the natural sciences, they know how to do this. <laughs> They value collaborative work. They value co-authored publications. It's not that this isn't possible. It's just we need to think about how you bring that into the humanities. So I think that that's one of our challenges. I think the other challenge, and it's one of the things that I really like about the Humanities Collaboratory, is how we use this kind of work to help people understand how the humanities matter. And as the Associate Dean for Humanities, it's one of the reasons I took the job, was that it feels like an important and interesting moment to be trying to help people understand why the humanities matter. Uh, as I've said in other contexts, I think too often we fall back on language about the humanities matter because you become a better critical thinker, you become a better writer. All of that is true and needs to be true, but for me, that's the baseline. I mean, of course it would, should make you a better thinker and a better writer, but it's not fundamentally why the humanities matter. The humanities matter because of the work we're seeing in these kinds of projects. They matter because it helps us understand what it means to be human, to understand the human experience, to be able to try to see the world through the perspective of someone else, be that historically or at this moment. So it matters because of the work that we do in the humanities, which means that part of that is helping people outside the academy understand that work and understand the impact and importance of that work. So what I love about these collaborative projects at the Humanities Collaboratory is that they have to have a public facing part and really think about how do we help people see why the work itself matters in terms of understanding the world and making the world a better place by having humanists at the table. So I leave that on the table as a welcome to all of you. I look forward to hearing from all of you as the day progresses, and I will turn it over to Kristen. Good morning. I, I'm kind of embarrassing, embarrassingly thrilled to see you all here. Um, I said yesterday that the Humanities Collaboratory is a reason to be proud to be at the University of Michigan, and I really believe that. Um, it's an institutional investment that is unusual and precious. And we are gathered today to celebrate the work that we have done in the first three years, but also to really think hard about how to do more, how to do better, how to think about the big challenges that Anne has um, drawn before us, um, and how we can meet them with the, this opportunity that we have. So this is part celebration and um, large part roll up your sleeves um, and get into the work of thinking together. Um, we are going to hear um, first from our teams. I've asked them in five minutes to tell you who they are and what they're doing. Um, so they will introduce themselves. But for this occasion, we have invited some people from outside the university to come think with us, people who are in the process of changing the landscape of the humanities um, across uh, multiple fields and I want to take a minute just to introduce you to them very briefly. Um, we have invited uh, Claudio Von Vacano and Adam Anderson from the University of California Berkeley where they are running the Digital Humanities Lab, D-Lab, um, and they are uh, doing really interesting work institutionally and intellectually in engaging humanists with structures um, to imagine themselves 
um, in uh, digital context and beyond. Um, Paula Krebs is here. Paula is the executive director of the Modern Languages Association, and she is an innovator there and uh, somebody who's thinking about the horizon of, of what that organization can do and what the humanities do more broadly in really compelling ways. So thank you for being here. Ellen McClure is here from the University of Chicago, Illinois. She is, among other things, running a, a sister uh, organization there, it, the Initiative for Engaged Humanities, um, which has a, a slightly more undergraduate focus than we do, um, but that is um, uh, compelling and connected to the asking the same questions and trying to answer similar questions as we are. Um, Antoinette Burton is here. She from the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana, and she is. Um, a director of Humanities Without Walls, another ambitious, exciting humanities project that um, emphasizes thinking across institutions in really interesting ways. Next to her is Jim Grossman, who is the executive director of the American Historical Association, um, who is also really pushing at the undergraduate level among faculty is pushing new thinking about what the humanities look like and how they should, how they should be in the world. Um, so I am grateful to all of you for coming. And um, it's one of the things that the, the resources at the Humanities Collaboratory has allowed us to do. We, we can bring these people in and ask them to think with us, which is a incredible luxury. So uh, thank you for getting on a train or a plane and getting yourself here and joining us in the conversation. I'm, I'm quite grateful. So before we start to roll up our sleeves, just so everybody knows it, kind of what we do and how we function to date, um, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about the structure of the Humanities Collaboratory. And as Anne um, uh, mentioned when she was acknowledging Peggy, who is everywhere and everything that the collaboratory has done. Um, Sarah Blair and then Provost Martha Pollock sort of dreamed up this idea, what, what would it be like if we gave humanists more money than they typically get? And what would it be like if we supported humanists to collaborate? And um, the work of giving that a, a shape, uh, not just finding physical space, but kind of how, how, what could that look like? Was a, it was a lot of intellectual work on the part of Anne and Sarah and Peggy. And what they came up with is, and as it has evolved, we have a three-part grant structure. So we have very, very low stakes um, initial grant, the five by fives. Five people, five meetings, $500. And to get that, basically, you have to have a pulse. Five email addresses to send me and a pulse. And the idea is, I keep talking to people who, faculty and humanities who, I have this problem I can't figure out how to address from my disciplinary perspective. But I don't really know who to talk to. So the, the five by fives are, just to get people in the room, to create an occasion for a conversation. And then we have project generous project development grants, up to $80,000 for May and June, for teams that um, are developing their idea. And these, I think, have been quite successful. Um, our teams this year use them really to transform what they were thinking, kind of, okay, we now have the resources, we can do a little traveling, we can start to really devote our time to working together. And those initial conversations really transformed what they then put together for their final proposals for our big grants, which are the project development grants, which are um, offer support of up to $500,000 over a period of two years. And that money goes for faculty time, um, but also travel, working with different kinds of consultants across the needs of their project. Um, and, you know, I do want to celebrate how 
um, how well our teams have used those resources to date. Um, but I also want to ask us to think about how we can tweak our structure to, to make it better, richer, um, and more responsive to this big ambition that we are laying in front of our undergraduates and our graduate students and our faculty. So we're going to start um, uh, the um, significant business of our day by just introducing you to our teams. And we have not mostly, this is really introducing the teams to each other because we haven't, we haven't done this before. We, we've had a couple of sort of very nice social events, um, but we haven't, the teams have not talked to each other in substantive ways about what they're doing. Um, and that is, uh, that is kind of goal number one for, um, for me today in the presence of other interested folks. So um, if you're on the first panel, if you wouldn't mind just coming up and taking a seat up here, and um, I'm not going to introduce them because we are uh, being very strict about five minutes. Um, we have half an hour, um, so the math just barely works. Um, they will introduce themselves um, as they come up. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> I remember. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we get started? Okay. So we would like to start our presentation by transporting you, members of the audience, with the images behind me to the deserted and remote uh, lands of Southern Patagonia in Argentina, where the community that is at the heart of our collaboratory research project established themselves at the turn of the 20th century. At this point in history, the members of our community embarked on a journey from South Africa to Argentina. And although this displacement took place more than 100 years ago, we believe that a part of them never left South Africa. We like to think about the story of this community as a metaphor for our process of collaboration, in the same way that the ancestors of our speakers had to face the challenges of a new land. We are, as members of a collaborative team, navigating the moving pieces of a research puzzle, remaining true to our original roots as specialists uh, within one main field, but also adapting to the new terrains of new areas of research. And this being said, the title of our presentation is From Africa to Patagonia, Voicing of Displacement. And I'm Lorenzo Garcia Maya. And I'm Ella Dean. So, um, who are we? We're a team comprised of faculty, graduate, and undergraduate students. We come from many backgrounds, linguistics, history, anthropology, religious studies, even statistics. Um, myself, I'm a recent graduate from Romance Languages and Literatures. Lorenzo is actually one of my professors. I took introduc uh, introduction to Spanish linguistics with him and it really got my interest going in this field. Um, from there, I took a lot more classes with Nick, our PI, and they invited me to be a part of this research, and it's been an amazing experience. At first on the project, I was working on linguistic tasks, coding data, um, but now I was just able to work with um, faculty on writing one of our public essays about our collaborative style, providing the undergraduate experience. So put simply, what are we doing? Um, we're investigating a community of displaced Afrikaners in Patagonia, Argentina, where we find a unique contact of language and culture. As a whole, our project seeks to analyze the speech, narratives, and histories of this community in order to better understand their voices and ideologies, and how those have developed since coming to Argentina almost 110 years ago. 
Okay, so if you were wondering how everything started, this is exactly uh, how it happened. So first we had an initial meeting with one of our colleagues in the linguistics department that told us about this particular community. And soon thereafter, we conducted our first field trip uh, work. Um, it was probably at the time that we were working on our first linguistics article that we realized that there was so much more that we could do with this community. So we started the funding application proposal for uh, the proposal development for the Humanities Collaboratory in 2016. And when we succeeded, then we started working on the second grant application. That was also successful. And that led us to our second field trip this past May. So all of this is soon going to be reported by NPR. So we're very happy about that. But before we start celebrating, let's talk about uh, why we believe as a team that we couldn't have been able to do all of this alone. So we know that we couldn't have done this as a standalone research team of linguists because we tried. And that's how really things started. Soon realized that there was so much more to uncover to fully understand the realities uh, of our speakers. At first, we were interested in their bilingualism, but soon realized that the story about how they became and remained bilinguals was so much more interesting. It represented an amalgamation of displacement, isolation, religious differences, and particular ethnic and racial views. And for that reason, it was ideal for us to work with historians, with anthropologists, with religious experts. And what is happening right now is that we are revisiting um, uh, our linguistic methodologies uh, to implement their, their knowledge and expertise, right? So this is when it goes back to, to linguistics. So um, what are we working on now? Right now we're working on several publications. Our first public essay was published in Babel, um, a magazine for people interested in languages. So that's very exciting. <laughs> um, and right now our faculty are exploring topics that are most interesting to them in their respective fields. So we have lots of things we're working on now, race and ethnicity, um, religion and isolation, language and identity, and code switching and bilingualism. So lots of pieces of the puzzle coming together. And <laughs> so this is big and exciting and messy. Uh, these are all just puzzle pieces for now. Ideally, in the future, we'd like to create a larger work to summarize what we've been doing, maybe something like a book. There is definitely a lot more that we could do to explore this community. What we have found so far is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and on that note, um, we're considering options to maintain this project alive, uh, certainly with more funding. And it's on that note that I would like to finish this presentation by thanking the Office of the Provost, as well as people behind the Humanities Collaborative Project, like Kristen, Peggy, Sherry, Anne, who very generously gave her time uh, to prepare this presentation. And for us, the only thing I can say is that this is a dream come true. Thank you so much. My name is Donald Lopez. I'm the PI, uh, which means principal investigator uh, for this, uh, for HO's journey. I'm a scholar of the humanities, so I, I wrote something. <laughs> uh, scholars of Buddhism spend most of their waking hours and even their dream time contemplating the nature of space and time. They tend to find this deeply satisfying until they have to teach a course called introduction to Buddhism. Here, space and time immediately present grave challenges. How do you convey a tradition that encompasses 2,500 years and all of the continent of Asia in the course of a semester? Our team decided to dispense with time completely <clears throat> and focus on space, specifically the space traversed by an 18-year-old Buddhist monk named Hiecho, who traveled from China to India 
to Arabia, and then back to China in three years, beginning in the year 721. We know his name only because a fragment of his travel journal was discovered in a cave in China in 1908. That fragment became the physical foundation for our project, a project in collective imagination that sought to imagine Keicho's world. This map is our reconstruction of his journey, which shows him leaving his native Korea, traveling then to Guangzhou in South China, from there traveling by sea, stopping in Java, going on to India, traveling to the sacred sites of Buddhism in India, down to the south, up to Afghanistan and what is today Pakistan, going for some reason to Arabia. We think he maybe got on the wrong caravan uh, and then making his way back to China. This inset uh, then shows his route through Pakistan and Afghanistan. And our research indicates that he got lost. Our team's concept of collaboration has been to create what we call circles of collaboration, circles of increasing width, drawing people from other institutions, other disciplines, and other lands into Heicho's world. This required that we set out on our own pilgrimage to distant lands. Our first journey began on June 1, 2016, when Kevin Carr and I set out for a place called North Campus. <laughs> it was apparently not far, but we were not quite sure where it was. Although we were both faculty in the Humanities Division, we did have smartphones, and someone showed us how to use something called Google Maps. With our route plotted, <clears throat> we began our journey and eventually reached our destination safely. But the people there did not speak our language, and we, could, we, and we could not understand theirs. They asked, what language will you be using? I replied, we'll be using Sanskrit for most terms with classical Chinese in some places. They looked at me in puzzlement. They said, I meant, will you be using Java or Swift? But we did not know what those words meant. And then we met Sindhu Giri. So I had heard about Java and Swift, but my expertise came in Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. I worked as a user experience and visual designer on the HRO's Journey project. And that's me and the rest of the student team at the Freer Sackler. So I encountered the project by coincidence, but the, I loved the idea of interdisciplinary work within the College of Engineering. So I applied on a whim. Being a dual degree student in art and information, I've always been interested in how technology can create new forms of interaction with art, especially within traditional museum spaces. I had very free, few preconceived notions before coming into the multidisciplinary design program an experiential learning program headed by the College of Engineering. I gradually found my place within the design team and the overall project group. HO's journey was different than any other project I've done since it lasted a whole calendar year and was the first time my designs were developed into functional products. I was able to influence every step of the design phase, from defining the very first workflows to iterating and reiterating on the mini games. Communicating my design choices to engineers was truly a learning experience, and while working over the summer, I was the only designer on a team with four other developers, and I had complete control over them, which is what every designer wishes for. Um, so because of my deep involvement, I have a really strong attachment to every feature on the app. Um, there were a few roadblocks on our project, I'm not going to lie. Um, during our meeting in April, the Freer Sackler team thought that we were developing an iPad app and not an iPhone app like we were working on. Um, but I can confidently say that our team develop, delivered two extremely useful products at the end of our term. And working on a multidisciplinary team with actual impact has been the highlight of my undergraduate experience. And I'm glad that I was able to use my skills towards the humanities, an area that I feel is often overlooked by developers and designers. 
So I still hear about Hatcher's Journey, and at the History of Art Symposium a few weeks ago, I met a professor from Washington University who uses the apps in her course. And she really loved both apps and even thanked me for creating a museum guide app that could be used in a classroom environment. Um, and I was really surprised that anyone besides my parents had honestly downloaded it. So I'm really grateful that my work can have such a great impact. Um, and I look forward to seeing how Hatcher's Journey progresses from here. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ray Silverman, and I'm serving as uh, one of the co-PIs uh, uh, for our project, Making African Art. And I'd like to introduce Evan Binkley, who is one of the undergraduates working uh, on this project with us. I should point out, uh, to begin with, that we are only uh, at the very start of our project. We received funding uh, in August, and so we're about a, a little bit more than a month into it. Our project is a multidisciplinary inquiry into a particular moment in time, the 1960s, when a particular genre of art, African art, experienced a radical transformation. Our story begins at the beginning of the 20th century with the so-called discovery of African art. This monumental and much studied moment in the history of art is associated with the birth of abstraction at the beginning of the 20th century. At this time, objects from Africa that had formerly been regarded as curiosities or artifacts began being studied by avant-garde European artists such as Pablo Picasso, who found in them a means to rethink visual expression and representation. Thus, the canon of African art was born, and it basically is comprised of figurative sculpture and masks made of wood, objects that are devoid of any visual elements that reference contact with any other part of the world. The canon of African art has been with us for well over a century. It is alive and well and thrives as manifest in a robust market for African art. It continues to be exhibited in our museums in the same decontextualizing modernist spaces where it is primarily valued as form. But something interesting happens in the 1960s. The canon begins to expand. And this happens in the United States. Wood figurative sculpture and masks continue to be, an, uh, to be very important, but the canon opens to include other modes of visual expression. Pottery, textiles, domestic objects, body adornment, and studio-based academic art. Our project asks the fundamental question, why this expansion occurs in the 1960s, and its corollary, why in the United States? We are pursuing what is basically a history project that we plan to present in a monograph, but we will also translate the narrative we develop into a major museum exhibition, specifically an art museum exhibition. Indeed, one of the significant dimensions of making African art is that it represents a deep collaboration between the academy and the museum. Much was going on in the 1960s that created a fertile environment for change. Our plan is to explore a number of arenas of social, political, and artistic activity that contributed to the transformation and expansion of the canon. So, so as Professor Silverman alluded to, the, the 1960s are, are this, is this particularly important period of development and, and expansion in the field of African art history. So our project is mainly divided in three research threads, the first of which happens to begin here at Michigan. So we think about the foundation of the Peace Corps as something that starts with President John F. Kennedy's speech at the Michigan Union, just, just a block away. Um, and how that, um, as an entity of, of geopolitical exploration, 
um, led to the development of cultural material. So we think of um, Liberian commemorative cloth bearing President Kennedy's likeness. But we also think of the development of collections of African art of Peace Corps volunteers, such as Frank Starkweather, just to the left of the commemorative cloth. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nigeria. Um, this dovetails very well um, with the Cold War um, and many of the timelines of, of geopolitical interaction that were going around during that time. Um, so if you look to sort of the mid-left of your screen, um, you'll see a work by Joe Radcliffe exploring some of these major um, figures in, in, in the context of the Cold War. But a second major and, and really crucial strand um, dealing with this expansionary process within the canon is, is the contribution of HBCU. So historically black colleges and universities like Hampton University that um, in the past have, have contributed a great deal of scholarship that has gone under-recognized. That in many ways connects to the civil rights movement um, and, and um, artists such as, such as Jeff Donaldson. But a third and, and really crucial strand um, is, is the reaction on, on the African continent. So we think as, as, as the canon is expanding, you have this great moment of, of independence. So figures um, such, such as uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana um, and cultural festivals just to his left, such as Festac in, in the 1970s, as moments of, of connection and, and interaction that can be traced within this timeline. Um, so we are very excited for the future um, and, and to, to continue to explore this in, in a scholarly publication and exhibition. Thank you. and this is a 60-second introduction to our project, the Book Unbound. Our three teams collaborate at a meta level, that is to say we explore ways uh, <clears throat> to transcend the format that scholarly books have had for 3,000 years. When scholarly books were invented, they looked like this. <laughs> they were all paper, and they were literally a line from A to B, right? And then even when you uh, <clears throat> start uh, separating the pages and stitching them together, it's still a line, you know, from A to B, from page one to page N, right? So what we want to do instead is that we want our books to have uh, multimedia content. Uh, we want them, them to have multiple uh, reading paths. We want them to have advanced uh, database searchability. So we want to rip uh, the books apart, right? And recombine them in web format. And the Heart of Darkness uh, team is gonna give us an example of that. Thank you. Um, because of the intense media coverage that surrounds Hollywood, um, non-specialists might think that Hollywood historians have um, endless supply of primary resources to deal with, but the reality is that most historical documents uh, related to the operations of the Hollywood studios um, are locked away in unmarked warehouses in New York, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. Um, our project makes a large collection of these. Um, located in the Michigan Special Collections Library, digitally available while illuminating a contemporarily relevant battle against fascism and racism. Um, our project examines a never produced 1939 adaptation of Heart of Darkness, intended to be the cinematic directorial debut of Orson Welles. Welles was a speechwriter uh, for President Roosevelt in the early 1940s and was a politically motivated artist and activist mobilized most strongly by anti fascism and anti racism. The FBI actually associated him as a communist um, and built a 194-page report about his, quote, suspicious activity and involvement with left-wing and um, anti-lynching and anti-colonialist groups. Um, Wells intended Heart of Darkness to be his most political film, what he described bluntly to studio executives as, quote, an attack on the Nazi system. He said basically nothing else um, to them, but they, they still agreed. Um, our project aims to explain how Wells balanced and sometimes failed to balance his anti-fascist and anti-racist sentiments while adapting a source that largely depicts non-white characters as animalistic savages and cannibals. 
It also examines why the project was never made, which was largely a result of studio executives um, trying to protect themselves from government censorship, as well as protect themselves from the loss of a potential market in Nazi Germany. Like the book Unbound, our project aims to discover how to produce more advanced models of digital publishing. So our digital publication will allow readers to page through Wells' unproduced script as they would a screenplay, supplemented with a set of historical annotations. The publication will also supply an digital access to a full array of relevant archival materials, as well as, oh, there's sound, um, as well as creative and intel and creative and scholarly content created by the editors. These include production documents, photographs, interviews, drawings. Um, we'll have 3D versions of set designs which people can look at with VR headsets, as well as animations created using Wells's drawings. Um, none of this could fit between the pages of a physical book which Nick just ripped up. Uh, developing a better book also involves learning from interdisciplinary and more general audiences. Since our project's inception three years ago, we have worked with 15 undergraduate students from 11 majors across the humanities, sciences, business, and engineering. These students have helped with the research as well as consulted with the book's digital construction. What I'm most proud of, though, is not only has this, project, or this process yielded really capable research assistants, but also exemplary research leaders who have been capable of developing their own research questions as well as managing their own team of undergraduate assistants. One of these really impressive leaders, Erin Ringel, will now tell you about her experience with the project. So I am Erin. I am a third year undergraduate student majoring in sociology. Um, I've worked on the Heart of Darkness project for three years. Um, and I am one of four project leaders who has their own branch of the project. Um, while some of the projects analyze certain aspects of the film, my project, Interactive Production History Map, looks at the labor force of Los Angeles in 1939 and 1940. Um, and my interest in sociology led me to this project because of its focus on historical social inequalities. Um, so the project has two main objectives. The first objective is to reveal the extent to which Los Angeles was segregated by race and socioeconomic status. Um, and we're doing this by mapping where the cast and crew on the Heart of Darkness lived during this time um, and comparing this to demographic census data. Um, and by doing this, we can see the extent to which the studio system reflected the historical segregation of this time period. The second objective um, is to analyze how Wells interacted with the cast and crew. Um, while Wells's political battles against racism and fascism caused him to butt heads with the studio system, our research Research suggests that he did little to disrupt the studio system's racial and gender labor segregation. Um, so this project has been extremely valuable in terms of learning various skills. I've gained upper level research skills by learning how to use an archive and also work independently. I've learned valuable mentorship and leadership skills um, through mentoring other undergraduate students. And I've also gained um, valuable group work skills by working with teams of students in different settings. Um, and because of this, this project has been one of the most valuable experiences I've had as an undergraduate. term lab to repurpose it, to make it less about efficiency, um, workflow, and uh, specific kinds of products which can be put out in a specific time, instead to claim a different kind of scholarship. We were very interested in the idea of slow scholarship, which has been making the rounds, because we wanted to make a sustainable project for people who are all trying to write monographs, but were willing to write a massively multi-author monograph together. So um, our lab came together because we wanted to answer a really, really big question, which we could not do um, individually, which was to talk about how it is that digital platforms seem to make things easier, cheaper, and quicker, yet produce 
conditions of great precarity, um, as Earl Lewis was saying, um, job elimination in many cases, yet persist in seeming to do something good for people. So um, the members of our lab are um, Sylvia Lintner, who will answer questions if you have them later. Um, we had three grad students, Yvonne Char Lopez, who works on drones on the US-Mexico border. Sylvia works on um, maker labs in China. Miriam um, Camille is a graduate student who works on Palestinian digital infrastructure. Anna Fisher works on precarity and feminist performance art. Irina Aristarkova works on feminist theory and hospitality. Cindy Lin works on supply chains in Indonesia and the use of big data to manage those resources. Um, Wei Wei Hu, who is also on our team for just one year, um, is a poet and also works on um, infrastructures that span um, and produce ideas about what networks are. Um, and I work on race, gender, and digital media. So we had a multi-sided approach. Um, we're in Palestine. Um, my work on Navajo electronics workers in 1965 connects, I think, very well with um, Sylvia's work on Shenzhen makers today. Uh, we are looking at the U.S.-Mexico border because that's where Yvonne's project is um, on drones. So um, what's really interesting to me as a group uh, is that what we tried to do worked and didn't work sometimes. So we tried to use Slack, didn't like it. We didn't use it. We ended up using <laughs> Google Drive and instead focusing a lot more on the kind of work we wanted to do and less about the platforms for doing it. So we were very interested in doing reading together. We read a lot of books on platforms, but we also read a lot of books on, um, on topics relating to precarity. And so Harney and um, Moten's book, The Undercommons, informed a great deal of what we were trying to do. We were interested in collective authorship, doing Thick Humanities, which was the subtitle of our project. Instead of abandoning the monograph, we wanted to produce a team of people who were all equal intellectual contributors at different intergenerational moments. So some of us have written monographs before, maybe more than once. Some of us are starting to write monographs. Some of us have not even thought about writing a monograph, but know that's in their future. So we thought, what better way to model how to struggle with the monograph as a form, which isn't a fast form, right? It's definitely on the slow side, by doing it literally in the same room. So we were also inspired by other collaborations along these lines. Um, Anit Singh uh, produced, along with her collaborators, an ongoing um, project called Matsutake Worlds, um, which continues to meet over time. And as people have cycled off of our project um, as paid workers or compensated workers, they've continued to be part of it. So Yvonne Char Lopez got a job in STS and Latino studies at Cornell, and he's still part of the project. He still wants to write with us, and he still Skypes in. Um, so our idea was to write a multi-author monograph with some remote participants. So this is Cindy Lin's point of view. She was facilitating our group from Indonesia, or Malaysia, was it? Right, from Indonesia, um, which was an amazing and really intellectually deep and engaging project. So um, here's what she was seeing as she was facilitating us as we were using our Google Doc. Um, we took all of the pages of our article for Social Text, which is an open access journal. Um, we decided we would only publish in open access um, and just pasted them on the wall. So sometimes the best technology is just tape um, and some highlighters. So here we are, you can see Sylvia and I are like, what is going on? Uh, we went through and marked up every page and kind of voted with our highlighters to see what to keep and what to get rid of. So we were using blue jeans for this in that room, actually. Um, and we wanted to use social text for our first um, journal article, which is right now um, being formatted and is going to get sent out, because it is open access. And we wanted to model a way to um, publish and be public, oh, sorry, um, without getting rid of the social prestige and the cultural prestige and the advancement that the humanities need by using journals. There was really no way around that. OK. Um, so I guess that's the end of the presentation. Um, I wanted to say as well, for me personally, this has been the most exciting and intense intellectual project I've ever been engaged in. I found it unbelievably useful. People are, um, in our projects are smart, committed. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you.
Yes. Thank you, and good morning. Um, my name is John Granzo. I am from North Campus, so I may need an interpreter. Is there anyone? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, in, ah, thank you. I'm uh, working at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance and Music Technology. Uh, the PIs on this project called Sensing Algorithms are Christian Sandweg in Communication Studies in the School of Information, uh, Sophia Bruckner, assistant professor at the Penny Stamps School of Art and Design. We also have uh, William Calvo Quiros, assistant professor in American Culture and Latin, Latina and Latino Studies. Katie Newell in, Archi Newell in Architecture and uh, Lupita Madrigal in Communication Studies. So um, I, we are just starting out. I've uh, stolen some excerpts of things we have, we have written to describe and uh, our, our project. As human experience is increasingly digitally mediated, encounters with text, media, space, form, and even reality itself are now produced by algorithms. Step-by-step -step procedures authored by a select few, then executed by computers. For the user, the reader, the citizen, and the audience, sense is computed. Hidden calculations determine what rises to awareness. As a scholarly response, we call into being a new multidisciplinary group that will develop new forms of collaboration, combining traditional humanistic scholarship with other creative practices. So this project asks what can be done to reveal algorithms at work and unearth elements of their operation that are otherwise inaccessible. The computer algorithm will be both our topic and our tool. In Lucy Suchman's phrasing, algorithms can be both a method through which things are made and a resource for their analysis and unmaking. So we will write algorithms to reveal what is hidden within existing ones, a matryoshka of the digital. Our group will take the organizational form of an art collective to join together art, design, music, architecture, cultural studies, computer programming, the digital humanities, and humanistic scholarly critique. Ambitious enough, I think so. Um, so the word algorithm still evokes some kind of uh, mysterious or cloaked process, not surprisingly because, in fact, a lot of these systems are proprietary and we don't see how uh, these things rise to our perceptual level. The billboard of ask.com elides the algorithm with such metaphysical capabilities. Not surprisingly, given that the mechanics behind our mediated experience through online services is hidden, indistinguishable sometimes from magic, a black box, an oracular positioning system. In consulting black boxes, we might assume a kind of determinism, but the rationale still eludes us. We are sometimes baffled at the results, at other times not baffled enough as we are hailed to some version of ourselves evolving in corporate servers, a cross-section of something like our purchase history. In an algorithmic culture, our everyday habits create an ever-expanding, inaccessible archive. Most of what we type, photograph, say, or do is now logged, sorted, analyzed, republished, and repurposed towards ends we cannot see. This argues for a new kind of collaborative scholarship. We must overcome, overcome the complication that, for the critic, only the products of these computations are accessible and not the operations or operands that produce them. Uh, algorithms operate on data in ways that are both personalized and stochastic. For example, uh, we might never see the, an algorithm might out, never output the same website or jail sentence twice. Computed experience, though built upon a bedrock of rationality, offers an incoherent, irrational plan for us. The many conflicting processes involved are fragmented, sometimes irritating, and frequently opaque, surprisingly even to their designers. So paraphrasing a lesson from computer science, an AI will beat you at chess without noticing the room is on fire. Our group asks, how will the humanities respond to a world that is constructed by these technologies? We note that one strand uh, of the digital humanities investigates computers as a resource for traditional humanistic work, 
while a second strand applies modes of humanistic inquiry to investigate computing itself. We are working firmly in the latter camp, developing a series of artistic and scholarly projects that address the problem of knowing algorithms. Um, in our initial series of meetings, it is increasingly clear that our output will be artistic installations as well as scholarship. We therefore adopt in parallel the organization of an artist collective and have decided to call ourselves the Utopian Swim Club. Keep an eye out for our algorithmically generated tracksuits. Thank you. <laughs>